Welcome to programming in modern C++. We are going to discuss module 58. In the last module, we have concluded discussions on uh, smart pointers, their policies and we have familiarized with resource management using standard smart pointers from the library specifically unique PTR, shared PTR and weak PTR, auto PTR is deprecated. In this uh, module today, we are going to introduce the notion of concurrent programming in C++ using C++'s own thread support. So, for this, you will need to have some understanding about uh, concurrent programming which I will assume that you have. If you do not, then you will have to read up other material to understand what is concurrent programming and what are its issues, because that is uh, an area which is not limited to C++ programming. That is a general uh, computer science knowledge about how do you program concurrently, parallelly and so on. Now, we will uh, specifically expose here to the library support through std colon colon thread component and bind component and uh, discuss what are the what are some of the common bugs in thread, thread programming that can happen specifically the risk condition and data race. And uh, we will discuss uh, examples of thread programs with such bugs and look at some of their solutions. So, this is uh, the content. Uh, for this module and let us start discussing with thread programming in C++. You know about processes in systems like process is when we start a program it starts as a process and multiple processes run in the system at the same time and the process processes can uh, share exchange data by what is known as inter process communication. In so, processes are con can be concurrent, they can be parallel and so on. Now, thread is a lightweight process, a multiple threads run within one process. So, the advantage that threads have that threads can communicate also through shared variables, shared data, because they are within one process space which processes cannot do because they have to protect the boundary of the processes data from corruption from other processes and so on. But the threads all threads are within one process and they can communicate to share data they can also do uh, inter process uh, communication kind of mechanism, but they are necessarily lightweight processes. And therefore, in uh, the in the recent past recent uh, in the sense of say last two decades, concurrent programming using threads have become a dominant feature. So, they, they naturally being in the address space of a single process, they share the address space with other threads and can communicate freely and for decades the C programmers, C++ programmers have been doing concurrent programming, multi threaded programming as it is said using several different libraries, predominantly the POSIX library, uh, which is common on the Linux platform or say the Windows thread library, then there are several others uh, like Boost and so on and so forth. So, in that context, what is special about C++ 11 in the context of thread programming? The special thing is now C++ 11 onwards, the library standard library itself provides complete support for multi threaded programming. You do not have to use a third party library like the POSIX library or any other. So, using the 
primary component which is the thread component in the library. You can launch a thread with a function, a function object or even with a lambda. So, you include uh, that component and suppose I have a function small f here and you have a function object capital F here and uh, they do not do anything they just kind of print a message the overloaded operator just prints a message and this is how you invoke the thread. So, you construct a thread T 1 with the parameter f the function parameter right I am using the C plus plus style of initialization because that is what you should be comfortable with. Similarly, it could uh, thread T 2 could uh, construct a functor object uh, to initialize with and as soon as the thread is constructed as in here it starts executing right. Now, if you just run this program copy paste and run this program you will see that uh, you are not probably not seeing the outputs it is not unlikely that you will see any result. The reason is this thread gets started as soon as constructed this thread gets started as soon as constructed and then main comes to an end. So, main now I uh, have created the thread. So, it is done. So, the main will complete, but main function is the main thread in the process that you are running. So, once main completes these threads are automatically terminated. So, they will not show you any effect. So, what we will have to do for an effective thread programming, we will have to tell main the main thread that wait these threads are still working do not terminate right now wait for them to finish. So, you say that by saying the thread variable dot join t 1 dot join. So, t 1 dot join tells main that uh, well you wait till I finish similarly t 2 dot join says that. So, with this now the both threads will have to complete before main can actually terminate and therefore, you will see the result. This is now the interesting thing is these are parallel these are concurrent executions they are happening at the same time right. Even though T 1 is constructed first and T 2 is constructed next and they start working as soon as they are constructed it is not known in which order they will execute the corresponding C out. So, if you run it multiple times in some cases you will find that uh, the function f 1 is executing first and in some cases you will find the functor f is executing first. I tried uh, 15 consecutive times and out of that 10 times I got this and 5 times I got this right. So, that is the indeterminism in terms of thread execution that will always be there. Now, this is this is fine as, as long as you are just printing messages, but obviously the function will need to have parameters. So, let us assume that uh, our thread uh, that the function or the functor that it tries to it is trying to execute there is a parameter. So, the function has a parameter let us say a vector and what it does uh, it kind of prints the vector with a range for uh, kind of construct right. Similarly, the functor has a vector as a local variable as a data member and it is constructed with that and the functor will also do that it will print that uh, uh, vector. I have constructed a vector. So, now the question is how do I tell the thread that not only this function, but I also need to give this parameter. So, for this you have a special template called bind. So, bind basically takes a function and one or more parameters of that function puts them together into a function object and then passes that to wherever it is required. So, it creates a, a, a functor instance from the function or the functor or the lambda and the parameters right. So, the bind is successfully used in this case in the first case to take the function and the parameter to pass to the 
thread. So, now when the thread uh, runs it is uh, invoking f with the parameter that my vec that we have passed. In the second case since f is already a functor we do not need a bind all that I need to do is to construct an instance of f with the my vec which I do here and you can see the result that that happens right. Now, you will uh, uh, also see that if you run it multiple times, you will also see in some cases the functor runs first, on some cases the, uh, the function runs first, it, it is indeterminable. Okay. Now, so we have the thread execution, we have the input. So, now the question is how do you get the output? So, there are specific mechanisms to get output, though if a, 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 as a plain task there is no notion of a return value it is just an execution in the thread right so it's not like a function which you wherein you you normally expect there will be a return value no this is an, this is a task so you just go and do that task execute that function execute that lambda and so on but there are special mechanisms of that which we will uh, uh, discuss in the next module but what you can always do is to get the output you can pass some parameters as uh, you know either uh, a pointer uh, parameter or you can pass a reference parameter and get the output through that. So, let us say we pass the vector as an input and we pass a pointer to res where in res we actually compute the sum of the vector elements. Similarly, here we introduce another data member in the functor and compute the add summation. So, what now happens is uh, if I in have to invoke the function I have to bind the function f the first parameter my vec and a second parameter which is the result. The result uh, is expected as a pointer to integer. So, I have to pass the address of that. So, this is very typical of how you call a function. You bind that a functor is created and you invoke t 1 with it. Similarly, a functor is directly created in capital F and if you now run it you will not only be able to see what uh, the list of uh, vector elements are, but uh, after both of them have joined that is finished you can print the results and you can see that the results are appearing here. Right? So, we have more or less the basic tasks that a function needs to do or function needs to do we can do that using the thread using concurrent executions. Let us uh, take a little uh, you know more elaborate look into what does std thread has. It is uh, defined in the thread component as a thread, it is a uh, represents a single thread of execution and uh, allows multiple functions to execute concurrently in multiple different uh, threads. So, return value is typically ignored as I said, but if it terminates by throwing an exception, if it terminates by throwing an exception, then std colon colon terminate is called, which means that the entire program is terminated. So, if any of the threads throws an exception, then the entire program will be terminated. So, you will have to you know control that within that. So, there are mechanisms uh, for communication of the return value which uh, we will we will see subsequently. But the most important thing is that a thread may not always have a function associated with it to, to basically uh, execute. So, the thread may be in a state or, or a thread object rather I mean not thread, thread object may be in a state that it actually does not represent a thread of execution. So, this happens after a default construction or you move the thread from the thread object to another thread object you detach or you join when the task is completed. Right? So, in this this thread object uh, is unique in terms of execution that is no thread object can represent the same thread of execution and interestingly the thread objects are not copyable, they cannot be copy constructed or assigned, but they are movable. So, if you look at the basic uh, you know 
primary structure of the thread uh, class, you will see that there is a default constructor, there is a default constructor, there is a move constructor because it is move constructable, there is a parameterized uh, constructor which is explicit, this is templatized. So, that you can send, you can see the there is a variadic template being used here and uh, it has a, uh, you can see that this is deleted that is the copy construction is deleted. So, copy construction is not allowed. So, these are the basic properties. It has a destructor which, uh, uh, which is uh, executed at the end of its scope. There is an assignment operator which basically is a move assignment. So, if you if you move a thread from a thread object to another, then this thread object will not contain any thread. Now, we will see this uh, through examples. I am just uh, leaving with pointers to you. Uh, there are certain observer functions like joinable. Joinable is, uh, is false before a thread starts execution or after it has joined. In between while it is in execution, then it is joinable. Every thread has a unique ID which can get that. It has a native handle, you do not need not worry about uh, these uh, native handle and hardware concurrency right now. But the main thing is you can join, detach or swap thread objects. So, here is an example. So, let us uh, look at this example. I have a function f 1 and which basically repeats uh, for 5 times writing thread 1 is executing right. and uh, then it increments a variable the variable that it has uh, got as a as a parameter it increments that variable every time right. Now, then what it does is this long thing what it means is something simple. This is std colon colon this thread colon colon sleep for. So, what you are saying that whichever thread executes this is this thread and it says that this thread will now sleep go to sleep for a certain amount of time that is for this much time the thread will not do anything. So, that is what is uh, available also in the thread component and then you have to specify the time and that is available in the library in the chrono component where you say that chrono colon millisecond that is nanosecond and so on also and how much. So, this I mean in just says that sleep for 10 millisecond. The second function also does a similar thing with thread 2 then you have a class which has a member function bar which uh, does it for thread 3. Then there is a another class buzz which is got the function operator overloaded it does the same thing and so on. Okay. Now, if you execute them, so you will see that uh, here I have constructed a thread, constructed a thread without giving it a function. So, it has a it does not have a id because it does not have any thread. Right, it is just the thread object default constructed. In the second, we have uh, given function f 1 with a parameter n plus 1. So, this is this is another way of uh, constructing the thread. Earlier we did bind and then pass the functor, here we are directly, we can directly pass that we saw the explicit uh, uh, constructor with variadic uh, templates. So, it does construct E 2. Similarly, we construct T 3 with another, we construct T 4 by moving T 3. So, the thread from T 3 goes to T 4, therefore, you will see that between T 3 and T 4 the thread ID is the same. Then uh, I have uh, T 5 which is from the member function, I have uh, T 6 which is based on a, uh, on a, on a functor object. So, all these will come and then they are executing and as they execute they keep on printing. Now, the difference is that uh, as they execute the order is not fixed. 
So, four threads are executing, right? But four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one. So, they are not necessarily, but but later on, if you just see see that is the order, then you'll see that it is four, two, three, one. So, you know, this order is indeterminable, right? So, this is basically the uh, typical thread uh, execution. Just a little word about uh, bind. Bind, as I said, takes a function or a function, any callable object, and the parameters and put them together. And bind is a nice feature that uh, it can put these parameters in the functor, and while putting them, it can specify some of the parameters or leave some of the parameters for future. Right. And uh, there is a there is a particular namespace called placeholder where these names, these are variable names as you can see, underscore is a valid uh, beginning of a variable name, identifier name. So, underscore 1, 2, 3, etcetera are defined. So, let us see, suppose you have a function with uh, three parameters and you want a new function with two parameters, where the middle parameter here should be 4. So, you want this, you want what you can do is obviously you can you can uh, write g and call this that is a elaborate mechanism but what you can do you can do std bind f and uh, then say underscore 1 underscore 1 will mean the first parameter of g which will be called then the second parameter of f you keep as 4 fixed and the third parameter you pass as underscore 2 which means the second parameter of g in future so, now when we will call uh, g 2 3, it will actually mean a call f 2 4 3. The first parameter comes here and this order is arbitrary, you can put the first uh, I mean underscore 2 first underscore 1. So, you can basically shuffle around the order of the parameters, you can make certain parameters default, you can uh, use it. So, this bind basically makes it makes a, a very generalized function pointer as a functor object and is very useful in passing parameters to STL algorithms. So, here below you have a uh, I have a sim simple example to show how it can be used as a as a callback. So, this is the callback type you remember the function component. So, I say void float result. So, it means it will take a float give me a void that is the type and I have a function that runs for a long time. So, what you do? You set another function uh, callback function, which basically will be called while this function has completed its task. So, callback float result, which says this is the result. Right. And that now you wrap your long running function into an asynchronous function, you bind the callback with this particular function with a placeholder which is underscore 1 that is whatever you will give to callback as a parameter will go there. Right? So, that is how result comes out here. Right? Just try this out, this is good fun and uh, in the next two slides I have given different situations for bind which you may just try out right this is this is not code to thread programming but i thought that uh, bind is so widely used in terms of creating function objects for threads that you should be more familiar with it so i have given a detailed example for you to try now so that is the basics of uh, you know what happens in terms of threads but threads are a, are a big boon uh, in terms of it, it enhances performance, it allows you to you know keep on when something is being done and the system is busy with that, you can still do something else in a different thread and so on, but they do not come without a price. So, there are different uh, problems with uh, threads. Now, the main is race condition and data race, right. So, these are talked about together. So, you might uh, have thought that they are the same thing they are related, but they are not the same thing, not at all. A race condition is more like a semantic error. A race condition is, uh, is a situation where 
operations of multiple threads are kind of mixed up interleaved so that they are not producing a right result that is a race condition. And a data race is when there is one sung object there are at least two threads which are accessing them and at least one of them is trying to write. If multiple threads read a value there is no problem, but if two or more threads try to read write a value at least one of them tries to write others may be reading then you have a data race. Often data race uh, you know uh, leads to race condition, but data race but race condition may just happen by itself. So, let us take a race condition example. Suppose we want to <coughs> do something very trivial we want to work out this sum of square uh, from 1 to 20 hmm? you know this by this formula this is what should happen if 1 square plus 2 square like that. And how we do that we have a function square which squares the parameter and updates a global accumulator. So, if I call square in a loop one after the other then the sum will get computed this is a sequential program right. Now, let us uh, try to do this uh, let us let us just for the sake of it assume that uh, x into x let it be a very heavy computation right. So, I want to do them concurrently you know when when one square is being done two square should be done concurrently three square should be done concurrently and so on they I mean x into x is not certainly heavy, but I mean just using as a representative. So, what I will do we will spawn 20 threads for 20 numbers each thread will do the square for as much time it takes and update the accumulator. So, at the end I should get that result. Now, if I do that so I have the thread version there is no changes uh, here, but here what I do I make a vector of threads and I push the 20 threads each with a different value of i for the function square and I am just uh, using a raw function pointer here and I just push that in the vector create and push them. So, they are all in the vector as soon as they are created they start working and uh, then I run over that vector to see uh, if they have joined. Right? So, this for loop will end when all of these threads have joined and once that is done my result is ready very simple uh, program. So, now will it work the question is will it work right. So, you try it you try it and it gives a result uh, 2840 uh, 2870 at its root you keep on trying it and well you always get the result and you are still thinking that well uh, is it is it correct is it correct. Will, will this work. So, let us uh, take two things one is uh, that well we had assumed that x into x is heavy, but we know that it is actually not heavy. So, let us make it heavier. So, what we can do instead of doing accumulator uh, plus equal to x into x let us compute x into x into some temporary let us sleep for a while and then add this temporary to the accumulator. This sleep effectively increases the perceived load or perceived computation time for x into x right. So, that, 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 that way I just make the load heavier by in, introducing a delay and uh, then I say that it will not be the same for all numbers 1 into 1 and uh, 7 into 7 may not uh, need the same uh, amount of time. So, I just randomize I put a random delay. So, what I do is uh, I create a uh, I create I generate a random number between uh, 0 to rand max and normalize it to 100. So, that I get a random number between 0 to 100 and then I use that in the millisecond. So, some occasion it will be 0 millisecond 1 millisecond or 100 millisecond and we try it again right. Now, so, this is uh, this is the total program I am just uh, so this is what you have done to put that random delay right which is what we have just discussed. Now, we say that ok we again keep trying it gives the correct result I keep trying keep trying I did this uh, for 36 times I got 2870, but on the 37th attempt suddenly I got a result 2845. 
the question is uh, what is the problem is it uh, is it is it a computer error or a false observation so i tried 100 more times more than 100 times but i always got to 870 so i realized that uh, well uh, before i can be convinced i need to have some automated test for this i cannot just keep on every time you know go to online gdb and run 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 getting mad so how can i do an automated test it's very simple i'll just put this uh, whole uh, stuff of uh, you know creating the vector of threads spawning the 20 threads and uh, joining of the threads within a scope so that they are all localized and put that in a do do while loop when have a trial count variable every time it goes through this loop this whole run has happened once and that trial count is incremented and how do i terminate the loop i terminate the loop by checking if the accumulator is 2870 if the accumulator is 2870 it is correct right so then i'll try again if it is not then i will exit but that means that if the program is correct it will be an infinite loop well but then murphy's law says that if anything can go wrong it will so let us see what we find so uh, with this this is again the entire program there is a random delay and this is the repeat and since it might go on for a long time what i do is every after every 100 trials i just print a message on the console uh, that you know 100 trials done 200 trials run so that you know i know that the program is working it 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 it's alive and then I wait if a wrong result would come. Murphy was correct. I did this for 20 times, and you can see this is the actual data I collected. So, when I run this program for the first time in the 56th trial, it produces 2845. In the second trial, second run, in the first trial itself, it produced 2806 and so on. In some cases it has taken 1502 runs to produce a wrong result, but in every case 20 cases it has eventually proved it. So, there is something wrong about this and if you look at all these values you will see that these values are less than 2870 all of them. So, what is going on? So, to understand let us you know you know split uh, into the simple square function as to what it is doing. So, what will the compiler do? Compiler has to multiply. So, the, the code written is necessarily x star x. Now, the compiler has to compute uh, x star x into a temporary, has to read the accumulator into another temporary and then add these two temporaries and put in the accumulator. This is a basic process. So, let us say I have two threads and they are they are independent. So, they the order in which those instructions are executing are can interleave in any way, but at any cycle only or at any point the instruction of only one thread can execute because there is a thing the, there is only one processor to execute. So, let us say if they are interleaved in this way that uh, it first does this in thread 2, then it does this in thread 1. So, in thread 2 t 1 is 4, in thread 1 t 1 is 1, then it does this. So, in thread 2 t 2 is 0 because accumulator initially is 0, then in uh, thread 1 t 2 becomes 0 because accumulator is 0, then it updates the accumulator. So, in thread by thread 1 accumulator becomes 1 and then it does this accumulator becomes 4, but it should have been 1 plus 4 5. So, you can see that the interleaving only because that both these threads have in this process started with a value of the accumulator which is a non updated one and both of them have updated after that right because of this interleaving and that is the sole problem of uh, having the incorrect result and you can always see that it will always have a lower result than what is expected and that is what we have been seeing and this is exactly what is called the race condition right. So, how to solve that how to fix that there are multiple solutions. So, I will just uh, talk about uh, two 
one is solution by mutex there is something like uh, mutex that is defined which is in the mutex component so it's a mutex and give it a mutex variable name then you do a lock on the mutex if you do a lock on the mutex what it does it is an atomic operation and what it does the first thread that comes here will get the lock and will be allowed to go and do the next instruction but the second thread which comes to this point will not get the lock because the lock has been given to one thread so it's like a, having a unique lock unique key so till the thread which is having the lock has not released it any other thread all other threads will keep on waiting at this point and when the thread which has the lock unlocks it then one of these threads will get the lock again and that will start proceeding others will wait right so this will make sure that at any point of time only one thread will be able to read and write the accumulator because this is both read and write of the accumulator right and we put it in the solution very simply only few lines are changed include this have a mutex and put this locks and then try again like our our repeated trials with uh, delay if we do that if we try again and we'll see i i waited up to 6000 uh, runs of this and the program did not terminate it is truly in an infinite loop another way of doing this is using what is known as atomic container atomic is a specific type of container where whatever you put as an atomic container can be changed only by one thread not by others right so you can just say atomic include this say atomic and things will get done and uh, this is uh, so just these two inclusion of this and instead of a global declaration you just say atomic int so it gives you an atomic integer so that when it is trying to change the accumulator which is atomic no other thread will be able to read or write into that this also solves the problem to try it 15000 plus times and everything was okay right so this is uh, broadly the basic uh, you know introduction to the thread programming and the risk condition we'll talk more about these uh, in the next module but we have got a sense of how to create threads how to run them how to join how to bind functions or functors to the thread and how to solve a very simple problems of uh, um, race condition using mutex or atomic we will discuss more of these in the next module thank you very much for your attention